uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the organizers. This is a fantastic stage. I'm not used to speaking on stages like this, but it's absolutely unbelievable what you put together here. Um, yes, so I will be talking about time and chance. That's, that's the title of my talk. And I'm, <clears throat> I will start with a simple observation. And this is an observation that's not, that's not technical. That's just sort of my feeling and, and something that I think makes some sense. And then I'll go through um, perhaps a bit more evidence for that. And then I will try to um, give an explanation for where this comes from. <clears throat> so the observation is this, that um, inequality in a society, let's say, uh, paired with a somewhat warped perception of reality leads to all kinds of problems. Uh, things like frustration. We feel frustrated, we feel anxiety, can even lead to depression or um, mental illnesses even. Um, <clears throat> But I told you I'll, I'll give you a little bit of evidence, so what do I mean by inequality? You can look at simple indicators like um, income inequality, and these are figures from the United States. And I'm looking at household income and its increase between 1967 and 2008. Um, inflation adjusted, $2,008. Um, the richest 5% of households in the US increased their income by $137,000 in that, in that time period. So that's an increase of 87%. Um, percent. The poorest 20% of the U.S. households <coughs> increased their um, income by $2,600, or 29%. So what this means is that um, as time goes by, inequality becomes, becomes worse, larger. What about that warped perception of reality that I was referring to? So I'll just throw up some names here. Bill Gates, the Queen, and I know I'm in England, so apologies, Your Majesty, and I'm in the wrong place to put the Queen up here because, of course, she is the patron of, of Good Enough College. Um, Richard Branson and Julius Caesar. My question is, what do you know about these people? And the answer is, you probably know quite a number of things, but my thesis is that these people, even though I'm at Good Enough, um, don't really matter to your lives. So what about these people then, your neighbor, your postman, cashier in your supermarket, or your bus driver? These are people that you're interacting with every day, on an everyday basis, but you probably know a lot less about them than you know about these people. So what I mean by what perception is that we focus on the very successful, let's say, exceptions, but really exceptions, atypical things. So that's warped. Um, here's a bit of evidence. This is not mine. This is from a book called um, The Spirit Level, and what the authors tried to do there was uh, correlate um, the inequality in a given society with, um, with the level of mental illnesses in those societies, and what they claim is that you can see a strong correlation. So very unequal societies have, have much, uh, <clears throat> much greater uh, mental, psychological problems. I want to say something, but just one more word, a sort of disclaimer about inequality. So I'm not saying that we can't have any inequality. I think that there's a, um, there's a sort of optimum level probably, but I also think that we've gone beyond that optimum level. If we have some inequality, we can call that perhaps um, diversity, and I think that's inspiring. So if you see people around you that are better at doing something, or that have more, or wh whatever it is that's unequal, that's inspiring because you can use that, and you can feel that you will be able to achieve whatever they have or do or can um, over time. It becomes frustrating when you have the feeling that the only way to achieve that is be by becoming a different person. So these aims are only achievable um, by other people. Now let's see <coughs> where this where this all comes from. <coughs> Of course, I can't tell you where this all comes from, but I can tell you my perspective, or one perspective that I've been exploring recently. So this perspective is based on the idea that we're making an error, or we have been making an error for centuries now in the way we think about randomness or chance. And I'll tell you what I mean by introducing a simple game. So this is a game. You, um, you toss a coin, and if head shows up, it's the queen again, um, you win 50%, so I hope I've made up for my uh, earlier remark. If Tails shows up, you will lose 40%. So this seems like a pretty good game, right? It, it's a 50-50 chance. If it's all good, you win 50%. If it's not so good, you lose 40 So just so everyone understands the game, yeah, I will play this in sequence. And um, on the first, so I'm tossing a coin once a minute, and I'm here playing for five minutes. And on the first toss here, I saw tails, second was tails, then heads, tails, heads, and my, my wealth, I'm starting with $100, follows some sort of trajectory. So let's play this for 60 minutes to get some idea of what's going on. Hmm. 
I don't actually get any idea out of this. It just looks like noise, some kind of fluctuations are completely random. So maybe I should try again. I'll now try the same thing. Yeah, I start again at $100 and then I play for 60 minutes, this is an hour, and, um, and I look at 10 different trajectories. That still looks like a mess. I now have some idea about the, the sort of spread of what's going on, but I'm, I'm not much wiser than before. Um, maybe I should point out that these uh, scales here are logarithmic, but up means you're winning and down means you're losing. I can look at 20 trajectories, I still don't see anything. So I'll just take the average, because right, the 20 trajectories, that's just a mess. So take the average of these things and you'll get some idea of what's going on. Still a bit messy. So how about I take a thousand sequences and take that average? Yeah, now the fluctuations go away. What about a million? Well, after I've tried this a million times for 60 minutes, it's a pretty long time and it took a lot of tossing, um, you'll, uh, you'll see that the fluctuations disappear. So now I really understand what's happening in this game. It's a good game, great, I'm winning over time. But let's have a reality check here. What did I do? I looked at an ensemble of a million, what, people perhaps that all played this game for an hour, but I'm just one, so is this actually relevant to me that on average some, something, something happened? I don't think so. And the reason for that is that I can't go back in time, or I can't access parallel universes where these coin tosses would have turned out differently. Um, so I'm really just interested in one sequence, namely reality, um, and my idea now is to try out if I can get rid of these fluctuations, if I can get rid of this randomness, not by averaging over parallel universes, if you like, but by averaging over time instead. So let's do that. This is the same sequence that you saw in the beginning, and now I'll just continue playing the game for a little longer. I played for an hour. What if I play for a day? Hmm. Well, so the fluctuations become smaller, but something else happens. I can see that this thing is actually decaying. I'm losing over time. Um, I've redrawn, this is the initial one hour, yeah, the little green section is, um, the original sequence that you saw, so I'm really just continuing exactly the same game. What about I play for, what am I playing for now? I'm playing for um, a week, so this is seven days. Well, again, the fluctuations become smaller, again, same picture, right? This is the old, the old sequence. Um, fluctuations become smaller, but the trend is still the same. So let's play for a year, all right. Now the fluctuations are gone, that's it, right? So I know what's happening. But what is that? There seem to be two completely different perspectives. One is this ensemble perspective where I've averaged over, let's say, all the people in the population or something. And uh, the second is the time perspective where I've just let time take care of the fluctuations and get rid of the randomness so that I can make some sense of what's going on. What I will say is that, well, it's obvious, it's actually obvious that um, in these in these cases that lead, uh, well, so in the perspective of ensembles, what happens is that you're, the mathematics, the taking the average there, overemphasizes these rare um, exceptions. So what is happening here is that over time, actually, everyone, everyone will lose. So you can think of this as, you know, you have a million people, they're all playing, and you ask the question over time, how many of them still have one dollar left? And you will see that number decaying fast. But you can also ask, well, how much money do the people have who still have some money? And their's, their wealth will actually increase, and it will increase so fast that it will make up for all these losses of basically everybody else. And in this game, what, what happens is that, yes, everyone, everyone will lose, so I could pick anyone. I didn't pick a particularly unfortunate sequence. I can pick anyone out of the population, and I will see that they lose, but in the aggregate, they win. And I think that we're not, we're, we're, we're not used to that. This is something counterintuitive, and we keep making this, this error when we're doing statistics when we think about random events. Right, so this is just a little illustration of what is going on. Think of time going um, <clears throat> down here, and I'm starting in some state, and uh, I'm thinking of these, these parallel worlds here in which the, the universe could have evolved, but in reality, time picked out one trajectory through this. So what you experience is one of these trajectories. What you do when you take an average like we just did in this ensemble average view, you're taking an average across parallel universes, and that's really not what you're interested in. Now, how did this all start? I'll just give you one slide on, um, on the history of our thinking about randomness. And I, I can't talk much about this because I don't have much time, but I'll give you just some of the big names. There's a lot of work before this, but when, um, when randomness was first really formalized in any kind of mathematical way, that was done by Pascal and Fermat. And they came up with exactly this picture. So they said, well, the only way we can make sense of this is by thinking of the world as a collection of parallel universes. And 
then we can think of probabilities as sort of proportions of universes in which some event occurs. So that was their idea, and that was very useful, and people used it and so on. But then later on, Nicholas Bernoulli in 1713 um, noticed problems with that. And you can imagine that there are problems with that, because sometimes this ensemble perspective, as we've seen, can lead you to very strange um, conclusions. So he came up with an, with an example where, where there was a problem. But his, um, his cousin, Daniel, resolved that problem um, basically by sort of fixing the whole framework and uh, rescuing this ensemble perspective. And that perspective was then embedded in economic theory. So a lot of, a lot of the uh, mathematics about randomness in economic theory is really based on this ensemble idea, and that's, um, that's problematic. It took, it took a while um, until the late 19th century and actually really until the early 20th century for um, others to realize or to fully explore the consequences of these two different kinds of um, averages. And really this starts with Maxwell and Boltzmann um, in the development of statistical mechanics. Um, it was then later developed and grew into a theory called agotic theory. Now, um, agotic theory usually tries to pick special cases and show that it's okay to use either of these two averages or these two perspectives because they are the same, but that only works for very special cases. So ergodic theory doesn't really ask the question, what happens if this doesn't work? It just asks, can we find cases where it does work? And then spends a lot of time proving these things and writing long proofs and equations and so on, what's the, the things that mathematicians do. So I want to switch back to sort of everyday uh, observations or everyday life, how, how does this affect us? And I think that really um, this confusion between time averages and ensemble averages is very deeply embedded in, in, our, in our culture, not just in our thinking about randomness in particular, but much, much more broadly in, in our culture. And I just picked out two examples. Um, one that I thought of was mass production. If you see all these objects that are essentially identical, it, it really seems like you can switch between universes. So you buy I don't know, uh, well, uh, you know, I, I shouldn't name products. I had a very nice telephone until about a week ago, but um, it was stolen. And really that's not a problem because I just buy another one and I'll get the same model and everything is fine. And th that has something of this going back in time. It's as if I could go back in time and not do the mistake that led to my having my wallet and my telephone stolen. Um, so we have this illusion of replaceability, which is sort of similar to having an illusion of parallel worlds. Another example I came up with <clears throat> regarding an overemphasis of ensemble and, and underemphasis of time um, is this obsession with youth. So we just pretend that time doesn't exist, but that's not, that's not going to get us anywhere. So in 10 years, what should we, what should we change? How should we start thinking about, about the world instead? Or what, what can we do? I think that one of the problems we're facing is that we really focus on excellence in, in many ways. Um, we've seen that in, in the mathematics, in this ensemble average, what dominates the statistics, what dominates what we end up with is, um, is really these very, very rare exceptions, the, the excellent um, people or systems or what it is. Um, but by doing that, we really reward fluctuations because we, we focus on those who've become phenomenally successful just by chance, just by a fluctuation. And these fluctuations um, increase inequality. So we shouldn't reward them, for instance. Now, another quick example here <coughs> of ensemble average is GDP. GDP is essentially, or take GDP per capita, then it's really an average, um, is similarly distorted by excellence. So I, I use the example that you have some billionaire in your population and um, he just happens to make an extra billion in a year, but 20,000 teachers lose their jobs. And the result is that GDP increases. And of course, that's, that doesn't really make much sense. It doesn't seem to be a good measure of economic well-being of a um, society. So finally, what about sort of very general perspectives on, <coughs> on life? Sorry. <coughs> I would say that we have these two, we have these two very different perspectives, and um, this is really about aims and, and thinking about what to go for, what to achieve, and so on. Um, we should not focus our energies in, in the wrong direction on the things that we cannot achieve, that we could only achieve by, say, switching universes or going back in time. So those things are really immutable facts. That's, it's done, it's happened, you can't change it anymore. 
But on the other hand, we can achieve a lot through time. So this is really this trade-off between right where inequality or things that we don't have now can act as a positive thing because they can motivate us or they can act as something that just completely frustrates us. So let's focus on what we can achieve through time and, and not on what, on what can't be changed. And my last point is that perhaps we should start doing things that we don't know. So we shouldn't be afraid of doing things where, where we're not excellent. It's fine, right? On average, we are average and not excellent. And uh, typically, it's even worse. So typically, we are sort of mediocre. And I think, I think that's absolutely fine. And I think we should, we should embrace that and not feel, um, not feel ashamed about that and actually enjoy it. So thank you very much.